Uh, good morning. Today it's Tuesday, February 6, 2024. It is 10 a.m. and this is a meeting in Senate Natural Resources and Energy. We're continuing our work on Bill S213, Act relating to the regulation of wetlands, river corridor development, and dam safety. And we're being in this morning on uh, some of the dam safety work. Uh, and with that, we're here invite to join us. Um, folks from Green Mountain Power. Uh, if you if you want to come up individually or together, totally up to you. Probably just primarily to Josh. Is so. that okay? Good morning, Mr. Good yes. morning. Uh, so for the record, Josh Castaneda yeah, is Green Mountain Power. I'm the Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer. Yeah, so one of my roles at GMP is overseeing our generation team and our fleet of hydro facilities and the generation that we operate. Um, I thought I'd just give a quick update on, you know, an overview on what we have for, for infrastructure, how we operate our facilities, um, and then quick thoughts on, on the dam safety portion of the bill here this morning. So currently GMP, um, we have a total of 53 dams and we operate mostly in Vermont. There's a few in New Hampshire. Um, of the 53, 43 of those are fall under the FERC regulation, and 10 of those are under the public utility. We, with that, with that fleet of generation, we produce about 116 megawatts of power capacity and 400,000 megawatt hours a year of energy. So, figure it's about 10, a little over 10 percent of our entire annual uh, customer demand through this fleet of generation. We, as mentioned, we operate most of those under the FERC regulations. So the dam safety side follows all the FERC guidelines. Um, and we, in addition to the, to the FERC, as mentioned, we have 10 that fall under the Public Utilities Commission. Um, we do a lot of the FERC stuff that we do. We just carry over into those dams as well. And then we adhere to UC's inspection schedule and dam safety rule for the rest of those. The things like what something called a, a DSSMR, it's a dam safety surveillance monitoring plan, DSSMP, um, is something we carry through, which is essentially just our process of how we inspect our dams. Um, we have a team of 30 generation team members that are essentially at these facilities on a daily basis, so multiple times a week, uh, working, you know, inspecting our facilities, working on our hydro plants. And maintaining our resources and making sure everything is operating safely. We then engage, depending on the dam, with either independent engineering consultants, um, a lot of other engineering resources to do our dam safety inspections, our designs for upgrades, and, and that sort of thing. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So, is the FERC standard uh, in any way you know, more rigorous than the QC standard? So that if you're going to FERC, then you're sort of Upping the ante on themselves in terms of monitoring and safety. Yeah, so the the safety inspection schedule um, for <laughs> so there's the hazard classification of dams. You've probably heard there's low, significant, and high hazard dams in that order in terms of their their impact. Um, at the first, we do a on the high hazard dams every five years a full comprehensive inspection. You remember and it's every 10 years um, for, or every, I'm sorry, every five years in the significant and also five years in the high. PUC, just refreshing myself, we do 10 years of 10 year full inspection on significant and a five year on the high hazard. And the DEC's rule currently is a little bit less stringent currently. So now I think it's 15 years on the significant for comprehensive and 10 uh, years on a on a high hazard dam, so the rules are a little bit different today. Um, so it is slightly different, and then what's involved in the dam inspections vary a little bit between the rules. Because we do the FERC inspections a certain way, we tend to carry that over anyway in how we do our SI uh, inspection report for the PUC. Um, so we kind of treat them similar, but there's a little bit of differences there. Mm -hmm. Same one. Uh, thank you, Chair Bray. And I don't know who to best ask this question. Are you all finished with your testimony? Uh, I have two more points, but oh, happy to. Well, you may get to it, but yeah. do you have any qualms with no longer being regulated under the PUC? 
with those 10 dams and instead having it fully go over to ANR? There's no, we don't have a strong opinion on where the other. So the one thing um, I would assume that the rule would probably be updated because again, the PC is currently a little more stringent than what's under the dam safety rule, uh, DEC and ANR. Um, I do have one piece of feedback on the bill, which kind of relates to the safety side of things. Uh, but no, and so we're sort of agnostic there. We're going to continue to operate our facilities at highest level safety possible. So, um, the you know the other piece that I just wanted to highlight too around our dam operation. So when it comes to to major precipitation events, flooding events, um, we look at our facilities, especially some of the, the ponding facilities, which are exactly the sound they can hold water back and on. First and foremost, operate them safely to public safety is number one, our team safety. And then second is can we leverage the dam to hold back and help during a flooding event. So this summer, for example, as everyone knows all too well, we had you know significant uh, precipitation event upstream from here on the on the Winooski River is our Marshfield facility. Um, it's essentially at the start of the Winooski River. During the peak flows, when the most water was kind of moving through, we are able to leverage the dam to hold back half of what was coming into it from going out, if that makes sense. So there was about 2,400 CFS cubic feet per second of water pulling into that dam, and we were able to leverage that to look to uh, meter out a thousand CFS during that period, which what that translates to is just lessening how much water is in downstream in the, in the Lenusky River. Um, so point being that it's we're able to leverage those dams too during some of these significant significant flooding events as well. Um any yep, sir. Yeah, um, well, no, I just wanted to double back and maybe you're gonna get to it. So I can wait. Um there's um oversight comes in different forms. There's safety and then there's also uh impact on aquatic species and habitat. And sometimes they could be in conflict, if I, if I understand it. And they like, you might do want to do a large drawdown to be safe side of a incoming storm, but there will be uh, a large fluctuation in the water level in your pocket area. So I don't know who whose priorities. I, I'm guessing safety always went down, but um, you know, we talk a little bit about yeah, sort of reporting to two different. Well, are you stuck sort of reports with two different entities with different priorities? Yeah, so to so, so clearly answer your question, safety is going to take priority. So the safety and integrity of the dam is going to be first and foremost. I think what, you know, which as relicensings have happened or updated 401 or water quality permits, a lot of those rules that existed in the 70s and 80s have changed. Um, something for us, the ability to, to draw down is, is a critical component. When we, Marshfield is a good example where we worked through that with, with the department. There was, um, the desire originally was to not allow, we worked, you know, and collaborated so we need to at least maintain the ability to draw down in the winter time to have the ability to pull water out during, uh, in advance of a significant event. Sure. And sorry, when you say department, which department? Uh, the, the Department of Environmental Conservation, they ain't on it. Are. So um, it is a key thing. I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to do whatever we need to do to maintain safe operation of the facility. Mm -hmm. If we can do that while um, improving water quality, we're certainly going to look at that as well. So again, first and foremost is the safety side of things. And then as we update permits, licenses, we're looking at the whole facility in terms of uh, water quality standards. Most of the time, the dam is operating where it needs to be. It's when there's a significant event coming or, or um, where we might need to pull some water out to make, make room. And the ability to maintain what we call winter drawdown, which is essentially make room for spring runoff, snow pack melt if we have it. And it's, um, you know, that, that remains uh, pretty important for us for certain facilities. And then you have runner river facilities, which are just water can it come in and go out there. So does that mean that um, possible conflicts in prioritizing operation are over? Um, it's it's around managing the dam for <clears throat> safety, not um, that you want to maintain volume, you know, flow, so that you can generate power. It, 
Sometimes I've heard people describe, for instance, that they can't operate their facility, make as much power as they used to under relaunch during the floor one. Yeah. So that's understandably a concern from your facility, some suddenly less work to you in terms of power may generated than a trade off going on. I don't know if you've experienced that with your set of data. You do. Yeah. So, you know, I, the, the way I like, we all know that what, what, with past the water quality, and again, in the 60s, 70s, 70s we learned a lot of things are going to change. We know when we release this, we're going to lose some generation. We want to maintain it's, it's clean renewable generation that's being produced for the last 100 years, and we want to maintain as much of it as we can. We know that there's going to be a shift there when we go to a re-permit, re-license. Our sort of priority as we look at this is dam safety, environmental compliance, and then generating as much as we can for customers. So. We certainly go back and forth when we go to permit, you know, we have our scientists and work with the agencies, scientists, we might disagree on the interpretation of certain things and we push to maximize as much as we can for customers out of the facilities while meeting today's water quality standards and then all of that while maintaining safe operations. So you do lose generation every time you um, relicense, but we work hard to find that balance. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You operate dams on the New Hampshire border, correct? Because uh, you, we have Trans Canada in my yeah. district. I don't know if that's technically operating. No. Okay. Those are on the Connecticut. Yes. No, we have some just over the border in St. Johnsbury and the Smith, you know, Smith and um, some sick and stuff, but not in Connecticut. Okay, so you don't have any dams that would be affected by New Hampshire law versus. We do, we do have dams in New Hampshire. Oh, that we count towards our generation. Correct. I, Correct. I guess I'm not concerned about those necessarily, yeah. but I was going to ask you if it was a pertinent question, how those regulations affect the dams that are on the river, because from my understanding, New Hampshire is in control of the river, but that's not a scenario. That not the Connecticut, no. We do, like, so we have dams we operate in New Hampshire and they're FERC regulated anyway, so they're the same as our FERC dams here. Um, so no, that's... Gray River HQ on the Connecticut River. Who does that? What do you? Which regulators? They, they just, yeah, so they, those are all FERC. I'm, I'd have to confirm, but I'm pretty sure those are all under FERC jurisdiction. Uh, okay. The majority of them, probably. Thank you. Yeah. I think I should talk about two that I'm, I'm familiar with because I think I don't. Just so I could get this less abstract. Yeah. yeah. The wild or dead. That's what I have to yeah, yeah, it's on the Connecticut River. Correct. It does supply electricity to the pond. It does not. Mm -hmm. We, I'm, so I'm not sure that, I don't, you know, so they operate a bunch of dams in the Connecticut. Some of that energy goes into the market. Some of it might be under contract with certain utilities. Um, we have a contract with them in general, which comes from the whole fleet of dams. I believe some of the other utilities do. I can't speak to that specific one, these Vermont, but... It's it's in the mix, I would say. It might just sell into the ice cream market, for example. But Vermont does not have any, does not regulate the wild or dam. I don't know. I believe the river is New Hampshire. Yeah, oh, no, the river is New Hampshire. Yeah, and, but I, I'm not 100% certain there. And, and I think they're for regulating. And what about Ellis Falls? Because there's, there's a funny stuff with the islands. Yeah, the, yeah same there. Again, I'm, I'm Pretty certain it's for um, those aren't dams that we operate or maintain. Because <clears throat> I, I thought that the that that Palos Falls is actually in Vermont. So one side of the island, yeah, it's fun because there's the power canal on one side of the island. You have Bridge Street, you go onto the island, and then it's in the New Hampshire side. So there's probably a mix of regulation there. Um, but again, if it's under FERC jurisdiction, it it's sort of agnostic to the state regulation is under FERC and so So we've been asking questions. I think you have some specific uh, suggestions. It's just concerns or ideas. Yeah. So obviously only in the dam section, you know, the, um, my understanding is the intent of this is really around dam safety. I guess the primary focus. And there's on page 21, um, and who regulates the dam safety? There's a, a full strike you know, because it's no longer the Public Utility Commission. But one of the things that was important there is that it, it really puts public good and public safety at sort of the top, the top of the what you're looking at. 
it reads to us, you know, I'm sure it's not the intent here, but it reads to us that as you strike all that, then you're left with public safety listed in a bunch of things on page 22. That sort of puts it like on par with all of these other items. So before it used to be, uh, you know, so it's on page 21, section two there, line six on down is all struck. Because again, you're, you're shifting it from one city to another. Um, in there, it says that, you know, the commission will have a hearing and, and it's really around determining the public good and provides adequate for the public safety. It kind of makes that uh, a you know, priority as it should. Then as you go down to section 1086 and you move on to 22, now it just has the public safety. Um, hold them on the right. To, yeah, I thought you said 28. Oh, sorry, 21 and then uh, 22. You know, now it has public safety and a whole list of things, you know, from Fish and Wildlife to Force, all those things. So again, I, we just want to maintain that obviously kind of the public safety component is 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 the priority to kind of look at the holistic picture there. That's um, interesting. Yeah, it just was, again, yeah, I think you, the purpose of striking that is it's no longer the Public Utility Commission, so that's it makes sense why you strike it. It just hooked out a few steps. I think it would be more than maintained in some fashion. Okay, that was the only thing I had. So I need to end the bill. So. On the liability question, do you have a perspective? Because the liability would fall, from my understanding, to Green Mountain Power in the instance that there was the way that we drafted the bill. Yeah. The in terms of the like, I certainly don't the, the language between strict or not strict liability. I think you're gonna hear from somebody who's more involved in the insurance side of things that can speak there. I just the, the piece that I think about is just a reminder that when we think of insuring the dam, the cost of insurance. And um, what we use it for, there's a whole lot of other things that insurance helps protect customers from. A, a piece of equipment fails, for example, happens, you know, a generator fails. Nothing to do with dam safety, but with insurance, we're able to cover the cost of a good portion of that work to protect customers from the major expense, you know, when there's some kind of failure. Um, so making something, if that led to making something uninsurable or extremely expensive, it would be a, a concern. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just, you know, I just want to highlight that we use the insurance is leverage a lot more clearly separate from dam safety incident or something like that to help, you know, insulate customers when a piece of equipment fails or something like this. So if I can just understand correctly, you're saying that you have a concern that if we went to the more, uh, severe liability standard for folks who are owning the dams that you are concerned as an organization that this would increase the cost of your insurance and not allow you to make needed improvements that are not safety related we still make those improvements or just cost customers more okay you know, so and and just to be clear safety improvements are not like an insured thing so just yeah. doing our, our work and improvements on the facilities we do every year all the time certain you know a component fails on a generator or something like that um, we have a deductible like any insurance and then it can protect uh, customers. So all that flows through as a cost of customers. If it, if it, if it, yeah. And have you spoken to your insurers? I have not. Okay. No, not at this point. That would be, I think something that would be really helpful for me to understand is sure. that debate. Yeah. Um, because for me, I represent people who live downstream. Yeah. So the liability being stricter means that from my understanding, mm -hmm. they would be more likely to get remuneration I guess yeah. if there was a fault mm -hmm. um, that occurred and it sounds like that risk of losing or raising your insurance rates would be detrimental to you so I'd like to understand it to those customers yeah yeah so the same folk like the point is yeah dollar yeah. more uh you know per kilowatt hour or a couple cents per kilowatt hour versus your home getting covered yeah I think if, by the dam breaking like this if there's a I, the way you know um when you're in a situation where the risk of a dam failure is occurring, there's also it's a it's a catastrophe. You know, it's a very significant situation where those homes that are probably like are probably suffering from major flooding and, and that sort of thing too. So um, you know, that's a yeah, that is a significant event if you're at the point where you're looking at dam failure from that kind of thing. So. And you would prefer not to have the strict liability. 
I, I don't know the language very well, so I would like, yeah, I would like to. You defer to someone who's. Yeah, oh, we'll talk to our insurance to understand that would how that. Be very helpful yeah. for me to. Yeah, if you could get back to the committee on, on that, because it is, you know. Sure. It is going to come to a fine point. Like it's sort of a yes or no, but we're changing the liability status and what the impact on GMP would be. So if you either support or neutral or oppose that, yeah, that would be important. Okay, okay. interesting. Yeah, I have one. There wants to. Thank you. Um, though I don't want to, if you have more testimony, I don't want to. No, go for it. Um, so um, thinking about how you fund uh, the repair of your dams or the maintenance of your dams. Yep. So uh, is it, I, uh, I'm assuming that any repair or maintenance costs is just, it's coming from what, for lack of a better under, understanding, I would call it like your general fund, right? Like it's, it's coming out of, you know, it's right. a line out of, yeah. Yep. And, and so effectively as Green Mountain Power customers, largely across the state, um, we are all collectively paying for the repair of those dams. Right. And so the people that are, most at risk if those dams fail, they're not paying any more mm -hmm. um, than say the average customer. It, that is correct. Yeah. So our our total power supply cost includes all the electricity we produce and purchase and the dam, uh, all the work we do at our hydro facilities just goes into the right right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um any other questions from So yeah, if you can chase that down, that will be helpful so we know really a clear position on from James. Yeah, yeah. Chairman Clark, thanks. I just want to um, clarify that I'm using the vocabulary. So you mentioned that the, the three standards for uh, a risk for a dam is the, the high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. yeah. have low, um, significant, and high. I said, yeah. Okay. My understanding, though, is that significant addresses one aspect of risk and high addresses another. When you're analyzing risk, you're analyzing the probability of something going wrong and the consequences of something going wrong. There are times when every time you get it on a jetliner, the consequences of something going wrong are probably going to die. The likelihood is very low. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on the other hand, you know, Try to use your cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my understanding is that 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 middle ground there, the the, the uh, say it again. I'm sorry. The, the significant. Low, so the yeah. significant yeah. means there's a likelihood. That's based on the likelihood of something going wrong, whereas the the high is based on the consequences if something does go wrong. No, I think what it's actually just purely the consequences is the way to think of it. So what, what those characterizations are, um, they're divided per, and I think we carry it through in PUC rule here too, is um, what is the impact if a failure were to occur? It's the consequence side that determines the, the, the significant high you know, so not is it more likely to fail, okay. less likely to fail. It's really, it's really if it fail, if it fails. Fails. Yeah. And, and that's the case for all three of those categories. Correct. Oh, correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think of it as a hazard rating, like the consequence of the hazard, how hazardous. Yeah. I think it's a likely which to fail. Exactly. It's it's the same as the jetliner analogy in terms yeah. of the very, very low with our facilities, the way we maintain them. Um, and it, it is a it is a consequence. So we have any vocabulary for likelihood? Um, well, for speaking for GMP, it is extremely unlikely because of the way we maintain and operate our dams. Other dams throughout the state, in terms of their what kind of repair they're in, the, the state and actually, um, I think when when Mr. Green was here, they have. They know a lot more about a lot more dams and the, the state of repair. So that's probably an indicator. Um, I know for us, because of the level that we maintain them, you know where, where we're at on that. All right. So there, that other, Mr. Green's other category was condition. Yeah. And so condition relates to risk, but it wasn't only risk. Yeah. It's that last table. It's poor. If you're you're thinking of the poor fair, and I can see yeah, that's the last. So, 
Um, any other questions for us, Kathy? Okay, thanks Thank very much for you. coming in. Thank you. Um, Ms. Morgan, are you gonna come up? All right, you're just like dial friends. That's <laughs> perfect. Your okay. sport, yeah. Always good to have company. Um, and then we have uh, on Zoom with us, uh, Ms. Merritt. So good morning, Ms. Merritt. Uh, you can introduce yourself to the committee uh, for the record. And, and you can sure. listening to the conversation, fill us in. Uh, and then your firm insures dams. Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Amy Merritt. Um, I work at Hickok and Boardman and I am Burlington Electric's insurance agent. And I was asked to speak in support of um, their concern about some of the proposed wording changes within um, the document that we're talking about. So um, I think it's helpful to understand how the dams are currently covered. And so currently um, dams are underwritten based on the best practices that Burlington Electric and others do um, take. And so the inspections, um, the maintenance, all of those good things that we all want them to do um, is taken into account when they're underwritten. And so because right now um, negligence, if there was something to happen, Burlington Electric did the best that they could, the carrier understands that we would have coverage for that. If we change the language, to strict liability that removes the best practices as being a reason um, that the carrier um, can not pay coverage. Um, so meaning that Burlington Electric did everything possible. There was an unforeseen event. Um, Burlington Electric shouldn't be held um, liable from the insurance carrier's point of view because they did all the right things. If they didn't, then there would be coverage. But with strict liability, there's no option. It becomes Burlington Electric and their insurance carriers um, problem, which from an insurance carrier standpoint creates an issue from pricing um, because they can't price what they know that they're going to eventually pay at some point. Um, and so ultimately, I think that the um, insurance carriers will likely exclude dams from coverage or the pricing and the terms and conditions will be quite high and make it in essence a self-insurance um, problem either way. Uh, and so our concern is just that there's an unintentional um, consequence of changing that language, even though in the end, we all want um, the utilities to do what they should do to maintain the um, dams and they're all doing that, but um, we would like to have insurance coverage so it doesn't impact the rate payers. So that's my opinion. And I certainly welcome any questions um, that I can answer related to the insurance coverage, not the dams themselves. <laughs> sure, have you on behalf of BED sort of um gone into the market and looked for coverage. If we were to move to strict liability, if you shot for a product for them, and can you say anything about what your client is? Yeah, well, the insurance companies know what each individual state um, and the FERC requirements are. And so um, until it's a rule, um, they wouldn't price accordingly. Um, I would say that um, strict liability is pretty common in uh, attractive nu nuisance um, type of items. So um, inflatables, um, wild animals, that kind of thing. And um, my experience has been there's niche markets in that um, regard that require um, a bunch of protocols, but um, the level of coverage is not the same as what you would have in a standard uh, market. Um, and in some cases, it's just not insurable because they can't price for it. Um, it it's just a known quantity. And um, to um, someone else's point here, the, the, if the proximity of the loss is going to be catastrophic, um, that's a big number the carrier is paying, not a small claim. Um, and so that just creates a problem. I'm not suggesting there wouldn't be a version of a coverage available, but whether the pricing um, would ultimately impact the rate payers um, because yeah. Burlington Electric would have to pay more premium to do so um, be, could be quite a, uh, quite a lot. In addition, um, recently Burlington Electric has had a property insurance um, issue with trying to obtain insurance on McNeil, um, and that has um, nearly tripled their premium in, in eight years. And so they're very um, aware of the potential impact to the rate payers with an insurance um, Insurable insurability issue. So, sure. Does that help? Um, and as part of um, preparing for today, did you end up looking at any other states that have a strict liability standard? And uh, I mean, it wasn't we didn't ask you to do that, but I'm just wondering if part of your own due diligence, you said, I can look at some other states where there's a strict liability and see what's going on in their insurance market for, for dams. 
I didn't. Um, I only knew about this on Friday, so I do apologize. But I did do some research, and I know that there's a lot of concern either um, strictly from the um, engineers who come out and inspect the locations. Like there's there's a ripple effect, um, whether that creates just an unintentional um, issue. I could certainly look into the other states that may have strict liability for dams. I'm not aware of any, but perhaps out west there may be some case law that would support that. So I could do that and share back if that's helpful. Yeah, that would be very, I mean, I, I thank you on behalf of the committee. If, if you could okay. take a look at other jurisdictions that might have strict liability and figure out what's going on in the insurance market, we're, we're obviously not interested in creating an uninsurable um, right. utility, so, you know, right. or driving, uh, but we don't know what the consequences are. Okay? Okay. Someone will end up paying for a catastrophic. Right. So what's the smartest way and the fairest way to manage that? cost, I think it's really what's behind what we're looking into. That's fine. Right. Um, thank you, Chair Bray. Um, thank you, Ms. Merritt. Uh, so I have a few questions, but my first one is you're describing that there would be a ripple effect that would happen for engineers who are looking at, I assume, ensuring the safety of dams. What is the ripple effect you're referring to? Because to me, it feels like the most likely outcome is that they would be more proactive for looking for concerns rather than less proactive. So if you could describe what you mean by negative ripple effect for engineers, that would be helpful. Sure. I'm speaking only um, in terms of the insurance coverage. So from an insurance carrier's point of view, if uh, an engineering firm is doing the inspections um, and they are inspecting dams. If it's strict liability, there is most likely, if there's a big event, that the person who inspected the dam, in addition to the utility, would be pulled into it. And so there may be impact. I was reading, again, ahead of time um, yesterday um, regarding some um, verbiage on one of the um, dam safety's websites that was articulating um, some problems associated with the engineering firms. Again, I'm not here representing them. I'm only representing Burlington Electric, but I could certainly share that if that's helpful to everybody. Um, yes, I think I understand what you were describing now. You're saying that the engineers could also then be held liable. Is your concern? Right, right. And they may not have difficulty obtaining coverage for dam inspections. Therefore, they would be less likely to do them or the costs would be higher. That's kind of where I'm saying that it creates strict mm -hmm. liability in the insurance world is not something that we look forward to um, because it's difficult to insure. That's all. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Then, Sorry. No, it makes complete sense from the okay. insurance point. Um, and then my other question is, in the event now of a catastrophic event, mm -hmm. let's say you know, not yes. about, like, terrible thing. Yeah, it never happens. But <laughs> right. what would happen? Uh, the insurance company would look whether. Um, again, we're talking about Burlington Electric, uh, whether they did um, all of the right things. But regardless of that, the insurance policy doesn't have a provision that says you have to do the right things for coverage to trigger. It assumes that you're doing them because in the underwriting of the policy, so every year we're gathering information and depending on the um, amount of um, time that we need the inspection. So whatever the FERC requirements are, the carriers are looking for that information. If there's something that comes out of the inspection, they want the, the utility to um, make sure that they're fixing it um, or addressing it promptly because they don't want to be on the hook for something that happens. So your example, something bad happens right now, um, we would have liability coverage. So if Burlington Electric and or anybody was damaged because of that, there's liability that's ahead of Burlington Electric. Obviously, if there's a terrible event, it may exceed any liability limits that anybody has, but that's a separate issue. Um, that's a um, decision at Burlington Electric on what liability limits to have, but we would have coverage versus if we have no coverage, then Burlington Electric's on the hook financially, which means that ultimately, I would assume that flows down to the rate payer. Um, okay. Does that help? Or? It, it, it was helpful. I think I'm thinking about it from a different vantage point that you're able to speak to. Okay. Uh, so perhaps I'll ask this question to someone yeah. else. But it just seems it, it feels a little bit um, feels kind of like a threat to be like if you do strict liability, you you don't get coverage anymore. That feels kind of nasty to me. Um, but I understand that's how insurance works, I guess. Um, so, but that that is the frame you're setting up here is that if we move to strict liability, essentially, you do not believe that you would be able to insure BED anymore. 
Uh, the dam is specifically, not the whole entity, um, but the dam oh, yeah, could different. be. Okay. okay. Yeah. The, I'm talking about the dam specifically. So the carrier could just choose to exclude that exposure. We would have to try to secure coverage elsewhere for that particular exposure if the, um, you know, the pricing and availability, right? So that's a little bit of an unknown since we've had, haven't had to do that in the past. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So maybe this is a different way of framing it, but in terms of I guess it's really the same thing, but like in terms of coverage for, you know, uh, you know, helping people that were potentially uh, adversely impacted by a catastrophic event, uh, the the likelihood of help or uh, reimbursement is actually better if we stay with negligence versus Correct. strict liability. Right. That's what I'm trying to not so clearly say, but that was kind of where I was going. It wasn't um, to to say that you can't have coverage. It's just that language makes a difference in the insurance world. That That's okay. So. Thank you. And just to make sure I'm following all the way through. So if uh, a dam has been uh, properly inspected, it's been deemed safe, et cetera, no negligence, but then there's a failure. Um, you would there is a then that utility has money that it can put into compensating people who are damaged. Is that correct? Right. The insurance carrier would look at everything, right? So sometimes we did all the right things, but we still could be fine negligent. We would have liability coverage because it's not excluded. So, right. So if the courts say you are negligent, regardless of all the protocols that were um, followed, we'd have insurance coverage to pay that bill. So the insurance company would be writing the check, not Burlington Electric for the um, first 11 million um, of damages. And so that is the benefit we're trying to to save, if you will, because um, I think it's a benefit to the rate payers personally. But, um. Sure. And, and it's like uh, auto coverage. You decide how much collision coverage you have. So you have how much liability insurance to carry right. because of the catastrophic failure. Mm -hmm. Failure. Yeah. Stop using the word catastrophe. <laughs> Yes, no one uh, has a catastrophe, but uh, yes. And then the last thing, just to make sure I got this, is sure. if there were negligence found, is then are you is the insurer off the hook, and then it mm -hmm. then falls entirely to B E D. Not no. the no, no, because uh, we wouldn't be able to secure coverage if they weren't following the protocol. So the the way the underwriting works is you have to do all the right things to get coverage. Um, if there was a claim and it was found that things weren't followed. Um, we may have an issue at the next year's um, insurance renewal, but it wouldn't impact um, how they have to pay. They're on the hook for it because we did all we could at the beginning um, when we underwrote the policy um, and they own the, the results. So they wouldn't be um, waived from um, paying out, if you will, for lack of a better way of saying it. Okay, so it's not necessarily negligence per se that determines whether or not there's a payout. They're covered and sweat knows on the way to gaining that, getting that coverage, did they follow all the right protocols? Right. It's underwritten to make sure, right? Because the carrier doesn't want, if no one's doing anything and it's leaking and there's going to be a claim, the carrier doesn't want to undertake that because that's a burning building, not in this case. So, uh, but a building that has a lot of holes in it, they're not interested in insuring for that um, because that's a problem on their end. So, yeah. Thanks for the okay. new clarification. Uh, if you if you have a little time to look into some of those other sure. things, I have a strict liability standard and what's happened to insurance in those markets. That would be sure. really yeah, thank you. Of course, of course. Anything in support. So, of course. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, that completes our, uh, unless there's anyone in the room, Ms. Schilling, I see you here. So I don't know if you're here to but say the rest of the conversation or you wanted to uh, chip in. Happy to take your comment. Thank you. I'm mostly here to stay abreast of the conversation. Uh, there is one remaining issue with the effective date. Do you want to identify yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, Elizabeth Schilling, uh, I'm going to turn you the front row with utility question. Oh. Uh, and I don't know if you want to wait for legislative council to walk you through the, the latest changes that have been made to the bill regarding the effective dates. Um, sure, but so you're flagging for us to pay attention to effective dates. Yeah, there's just an issue um, with the effective dates because as it's drafted now, it's an iterative transition. Yeah. So the commission would need to maintain our jurisdiction under Chapter 43 until all of the dams are transferred to A&R. Okay. Um, anyone else in the room to invite testimony on the dams and or liability? Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone.
So we are going to change gear and move to Bill S290, an act relating to the Study Committee on Dam Emergency Action Planning. Uh, another bill, the same arena, but uh, of those. So we'll pause for a minute while people uh, move around. We need to get Senator Hirschwood over, um, who's the bill sponsor, and get the legislative council in the room. Okay. Michael Brady came in to talk about pizza, but yes. <laughs> Are we working on this one with paper or the I think we're going to get uh, mm -hmm. three for us. Okay. Um, There's one minute of bounce. Let's just do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Senator Kirchler. Good morning. Good to see you. Thanks for coming over. Um, so we, uh, we're Everyone's getting copies right now of this presenting your bill. And here you're talking about dance a lot here. So we're right. another session and uh, including things like emergency preparedness. So happy to hear what you were thinking and um, if you could uh, do the civilian walkthrough of your bill and then yeah. Mr. Brady will give a legal walk. Yeah, okay. The Kurt Swick Center from Washington the District. Um, this bill, some of the background is that I live in Marshfield. Marshfield has a dam. When I was on the Baltimore Fire Department a few years ago, there was an event where we had an emergency event where we thought that might top over. There might be enough so much water overtopping the dam. There's questions about would that risk the dam? But even if, even regardless of that, if enough water topped over, it would take out several bridges through the town, both Marshfield. And playing field, but then we started to think. Uh, so after that event, we didn't talk over. We didn't have any problems. We were, but we were going door to door, people along the river corridor, warning them that this might happen tonight. So be yeah. okay. So that just generated a lot of discussion about well, what's the responsibility for Marshfield, for Plainfield, the East Montpelier, and Montpelier if something happens. So we have like maybe the smallest town responsible for the emergency of this dam that affects. Towns that are much bigger and more prepared have more emergency and capabilities. So that was kind of some of the background. Yeah. This bill. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Did the, so that's a GMP dam, right? Yes. Yes, and they have emergency action plan. You know, like part of the well, the new rule that's going in their way specifies an emergency action plan has to be prepared. I don't know if that's going to current on as well. So, yeah. Uh, when I was on the select board, I do remember we. Were getting their plan. Yeah. Like they were required to send it to the town. So that, that was some of the background. And then Representative Mahali, when he got elected, that represents Marshfield, like Bill McCallis, the, the same kind of people approached him and said, like, well, we, we don't know if this ever really got dealt with properly. So he started looking at it. And so this language, I think, is identical or very close to the language that he introduced for the house. Okay. So that's, you know, kind of where the, the language came from and work that he had done about a study to see, like, how do we deal with this regionalization of the issues around a dam that doesn't affect just the town where the dam is, but affects everybody downstream. Yeah. Okay. So you create a study committee. Basically, we create a study committee, have JFO, Fiscal office, legislative operations, you know, help help staff yeah. the, the committee. The, the committee meets, and, you know, it's like, where are these hazardous stands? And give recommendations on, on how to move forward. Okay. okay. And what's the last year? You know, uh, I. Oh, she was not, unless, unless it wasn't in the Senate. It might have been done in the House. Right. Um, okay, so we'll look at dates. Right. Yeah. Um, any, so basically thinking about how those emergency action plans get communicated mm -hmm. in a coordinated way because more than one town needs to be aware of what's going on and have a plan. Right, and how does it, you know, it's, is it the dam owner's responsibility to identify each town and then, or, you know, is there some, is there a better way for the towns to communicate in each, each emergency response in, in those towns? Yeah. I think the way it was back then, what happened is somebody from GFE tried to contact somebody from each town. Yeah. And I don't even know 
if they did contact the towns below downstream. Right, which I don't know if Montpelier got a call. I don't think so. I think only Marshfield got a call. And so we were notifying people right there. And then through mutual aid, probably Plainfield and Miss Montpelier heard about that, but I don't think Montpelier is not under the blades of them. But so that that was the concern. So that so that was brought up again to Representative Mahali, who thought like let's figure, let's figure this out. Yeah, is this is could a study committee help? And so as far as who's on the committee and some of the specifics, you know, I'm not waited to like totally up to your committee to work on if you've got changes there. That's that, that would be fun. Great. Yeah. Um thank you. That makes sense to me. Uh Senator Watson. Thank you. Really glad that we're taking this up. Um, one of the changes that I am just anticipating, which I assume would be not a big deal, is like, so, well, actually, let me back up. I have two questions. So one is, um, it references a regional emergency action plan, and I assume that that doesn't exist yet. Like, there are emergency action plans that the dams are required to prepare, um, and I know they're going through a process of, like, how those should be dealt with, but um, but I am assuming that this is sort of imagining a new level of plan that would go beyond the towns, which is just addressed in the emergency action plan. Right. So okay. it mentions the RBCs as being yeah. the life of the entity that was. And so, and then so um, in the list of like things that should be in that <clears throat> regional action plan, one of the things that no, I'm just saying, you know, like I'm anticipating maybe adding is like notification responsibilities. Like who yeah. who does it fall on to send out the alert, you know, something's happening. So and what kind of alert is like? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, just think of them. Okay. Uh thank you, Mr. Chair. I am very supportive of this bill passing in whatever mm -hmm. format it needs to be passed. And I'm wondering, there's been a conversation about its best location. And this, and I apologize, I was out of the room. I assume that you're considering adding this to S213. Well, I met with Senator Hardy this weekend, and we were talking about how there's, you know, in government operations here, what we had a response to flooding bills from almost other end. So I don't know if it becomes more of a municipal government bill and then travels in something you're doing, or if it travels in this bill, I don't couldn't it feels to me like it could go either way, but uh, you know, so well, we should chase down. You're both on GovOps. Yeah. So if you could talk with, I've already mentioned this yes. to the chair, maybe while you're in there, you can have more conversations and see if it's the fit is better in work you're already doing there, or if it's an add on here. I think, Mr. Chair, I would defer to your preference on this as the chair of the committee. I truly do not know strategically between the two committees which one it makes more sense in. I do think it's with the municipal piece more relevant to GovOps, but it got referred here. So, hey, you know, mm -hmm. that maybe is a symbol it should go in this bill so we don't have to move it all around. But I really would be concerned that we lose it in the shuffle. That's my main anxiety at the moment. So okay. I would have no anxiety. I would not lose it in the shuffle. You've relieved me while I'm done. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Um, any other questions for Senator Pearson? Great. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for thanking me. Yes. Yeah, he's for Rich. We'd like to move over to the committee. We'll put it in transportation. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Green, thanks for coming. You can walk us through and fill us in. So one of the, this is Mike Green, I say the cast. So one of the things that Senator Kurtzler did reference that the committee will also look at is the cost. Mm -hmm. Who pays for the municipal costs of firing equipment, firing uh, the training um, that municipal fire departments and other responders need. Um, in order to be prepared for the possible hazards posed by the dam failure. So that is another one of the 
driving forces in, uh -huh. in the study committee. So you'll see that it's a session law for study committee. Um, it's created to review and recommend how to improve regional emergency action. And on page two, the hazard caused by data failure, including how to shift responsibility for planning from individual municipalities to regional authorities, how to improve implementation, and how to fund dam emergency action planning at the regional level. There is uh, an eight person committee created, a House member, Senate member. Somebody from DEC Dam Protection, someone from PUC, two representatives of regional planning commissions, one member of the Division of Emergency Management from the Department of Public Safety, and one legal owner of a dam uh, appointed by the speaker upon the recommendation of the dam safety program. On page three, line four, you'll see the powers of the study committee. They will identify those dams that are at high hazard. So you already know that the state is identified by hazard dams. But they all, this committee would also identify those that would have a significant possibility of flooding populated areas. So that is part of what a high hazard dam is. If it fails, will it flood populated areas? But now they're going to have to make a determination which have a significant possibility of that. I was wondering about that um because that's it's not a reference to condition it's mm -hmm. just like that's a part of the definition of a high hazard dam so i feel a little redundant but it is a little redundant i probably i would recommend you talk to the dam safety program about whether they can clarify that mm -hmm. yeah i mean i wonder if they're thinking like there must be a threshold right, uh, high address yeah et cetera. Right, yeah, exactly. Like if we can match that with like high, huh, some of the high. Well, I, I don't know. Right. There was Mr. Green was talking to us about there was a high hazard dam. Um, yeah, high hazard. Um, that I think the well, potential loss of life was like one person for that one person. That's a big deal. But then there was like water barrier that was like 1,500 people, but they still both were. They had the same classification. I match. Right. Right. If loss of life is well, probable, but <laughs> so moving on, page three, line eight, the committee is also going to summarize the existing municipal responsibilities for emergency planning um, and implementation, including how those responsibilities are funded and whether place of responsibility with individual municipalities is appropriate. I think you've heard Senator Thurgood basically framing that issue. Should Marshfield be responsible for following the towns and the dam's watershed? And page three, line 12, they will identify the regional planning commissions in which a dam identified under subdivision one is located. They will recommend the content for a regional emergency action plan for each dam identified under sub one including the necessary evacuations, sheltering, and the location of emergency management centers. It will recommend who should prepare a regional action plan for each dam identified under sub one, including the basis for the recommendation on the role of regional planning commissions, then they have an estimate of the cost of the production of these regional emergency action plans, estimate of the cost of region, for regional planning commissions and municipalities to implement, including a recommended source of funding. They get all these systems from us, your legislative staff, legislative operations will um, do planning, GFO will fiscal, legislative council legal. Uh, Generally, we've been trying to move away from led staff, staffing committees where there's only one member of the House and one member of the Senate. Um, this was the request of the sponsor uh, from the House. There is a date in here that needs to be changed, page 4, line 14. It says honor reporting 7, 15, 2023. That should be 2024. No. Well, that's why I was asking you to put this injury flat here. The study committee submits a report to the General Assembly. Any of their recommendations? Let's have to call the first meeting. Maybe selects its own chair. Study committee ceases to exist on March 1, 2024. That has to change as well. Yeah. 
and then you all get compensation and reimbursement and so do the non legislative numbers. Um, is the uh, uh, I, the um, whatever transition away from uh, which council staffing when there's only one house, one senator, one or two, whatever is that uh, a capacity issue or that it is, it is. Um, we're, we're trying to limit the amount of work that gets placed on us basically between September and November. Right there. It's, there's other stuff going on as well. Okay. Um, Thank you for all you're doing. <laughs> we can find bills that add to ledge council and then the vote keeps stripping, but no. Um, that won't work so far. Well, I didn't see another bill on that this year, I think. <laughs> oh, All right. Um, any questions from Mr. Ray? Okay. This seems like one of those things that you would imagine might already be happening. Well, the thing I would recommend is talking to the Division of Emergency Management and how they coordinate their statewide plans. You know, every there is a statewide plan. Uh, every agency, uh, I assume the PUC is supposed to, to contribute to that. Each agency has what's called an annex to that plan and how they will address the relevant subject matter or jurisdictions that are under their authority. Um, but it's a statewide plan. Right? And it, it's not regional. I, I, I don't know how it interfaces with you know, each individual dam's emergency action plan and how, how and when that responsibility shifts to the state. Um, if, if it ever really does, it always remains within this power. Um, so you want to? Uh, thank you, Chair Bray. I almost, okay, do you get to comment on jurisdiction? Do you know anything about committees of jurisdictions? I mean, that, or I know you know, but are you able to comment on that? Uh, well, I mean, know? I know what every committee's jurisdiction is, but the, where a bill goes is really up to uh, <laughs> the president of the Senate upon the recommendation of the Secretary of the Senate after consultation with the pro tab. But you could see maybe it existing in both the GovOps and in this committee, perhaps. That would be a fair choice they could make. It, it would. I mean, I under I, you know, Tucker's talked to me a little bit about what's going on in GovOps, and, and you could see this being in that bill. I could see this being in that bill. I could see it being in this bill. This you're doing a damn safety revision. And this relates to dam safety. You're also doing a municipal response provision, which relates to whose responsibility, municipal or regional. I think that'll be your place. Okay. Thank you. Um, regardless of whether it's a PUC regulated dam or an PNR regulated dam, they use the same dam safety rules. It's the only kind of rule related to dams, because something about emergency action, emergency action plan requirement. That's in our current dam safety rule. Mm -hmm. that would be. So, yes, but I don't know if PUC has adopted those rules as their own. Um, I don't think they have. I think they still have their own dam safety rules. Would you like me to take this, please? Uh, Elsa Schilling with the uh... The Vermont Public Utility Commission. Uh, so we do have our own separate dam safety rules. Uh, they were updated not that long ago to uh, include some updates that a &R made to their dam, dam safety rules. Uh, our rules have a provision, a very short provision requiring emergency plans for the high and or the high and significant hazard dams. Is it pretty much? So I'm just wondering, while we're doing housekeeping, trying to organize, if we should think about um, making sure that the ANR regulated dams and the PUC regulated dams have the same kind of coordinated response in terms of the AP communicating. Well, I mean, well, so, so, so as the as, as 213 is drafted right now, we would be 
transferring yeah. this jurisdiction uh, to a &R yeah. very shortly. So actually, if the committee were to proceed with S290, we would look to actually be removed from that committee because we would yeah. not be maintaining a jurisdiction over dance safety. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, although we didn't, I didn't mind to ask this question, but we'll might as well ask it while we're all together. Um, is is the PUC have a position on that transmission of day management oversight from your area to Ann Arbor? Sure. Uh, We'd like to expedite that transition, um, but are open to different time frames. Okay. So, Brett, I think, and I don't want to speak for you, but you testified that you supported the bill yeah. 213, yeah. but there's the issue of the effective date. Yeah. Right. And that that is the advocates have proposed a tiered effective date, mm -hmm. which really means the PUC would have to maintain jurisdiction until 2028. Mm -hmm. To the last thing right. out of the yeah. So that is, I just, my email earlier yeah. said that the, the, I didn't fix it, right. but it needs fix fixing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions for the council on this bill? Thank you. Um, so we've been turning on, but we, the next. Uh, Senator Brock has asked to move off his introduction on S-294 and activate the minimum time frames to act applications related to development housing. Um, so we'll reschedule that. Uh, and we're actually just about right on time to go to the other next schedule thing, back to S-213. And we got we're daily on wetlands, where we ran sort of times to end last week. So how about if we take just a three-minute break? I know people have been stepping in and out, but set of natural resources and energy. Uh, today is the 6th of February. I'm resuming our work on SP13 and activating the regulation of wetlands, river core development, and dam safety. Uh, we're going to follow up with um, Mr. Brady has provided us with a new draft of the bill. So to help us all get back on the same page. Asking to walk us through um, the current draft. <clears throat> Make sure that we're truly in sync with so we all have new smart copies from previous morning in this draft 2.1 and stand 2524 cm. Is that right? I don't know what, what the committee would like to do. We have a you have a copy. Uh, if it if it's easy enough for you to do it, if we stream it, then other people can watch. It's on the website. Or it's on the website. Whatever you want. If you want me to put it up, I can put it up. If it's not a hassle, let's do that just so that and we're listening without a piece of paper. We'll see what we're looking for. Just one second, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I should have, I didn't realize that we need to do that setup. So I'm thinking we're going to do it this way. Okay. And it's the sooner and better for later. Okay. Great. Thank you. So uh, this is Michael Grave. Let us say the council you have in front of you. Uh, we got 2.1 dated yesterday at 2.35 p.m. Um, so uh, I can walk through the changes, but I can also give you a broad overview of everything, whatever you would prefer. I think if we could do the broad overview as well, we maybe spend more time on the changes. So okay. uh, that way you can really see the bill. 
as a whole? Um, the first few sections relate to uh, wetlands management in the state and uh, probably the first six sections uh, and uh, how that policy, policy would be changed. Section one is the general policy for the wetlands section. It had previously said the water and wet, water resources and wetlands management policy, but it was proposed to strike wetlands because wetlands are water resources. Um, one of the things that uh, is made, the change made on page one, line 14 and 15, is to say that the policy of the state is now a net gain of wetland acreage. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of what happens with the remaining sections. There's a section two, an addition of dam removal for the wetlands definition, because that will be an activity that will be addressed um, under permitting uh, of activities in wetlands. The section three is an update of the not significant wetlands inventory maps. Currently, the A and R is supposed to revise these maps every time they make a determination, uh, but they don't. Um, or at least not in a timely way, what the section now requires that they annually update those significant wetlands inventory maps and advisory mapping layers on the resource atlas annually. Um, and they will include specific reference material or files. Um, and uh, Mr. Grady, when you say uh, make a determination, so this is when a permit is coming in and now they're out around truthing the as part of the permit making for a uh, so, property that um, determination? So a permit can, an uh, application can come in on, a, on, a, on an area that the agency has already determined is allowed. Okay. And a permit application can come in on an area where it's not certain as of yet whether the area is a wetland and the agency has the ability an existing statute based on the significant values and functions being offered, whether to designate that as a class two wetland and then require a permit. Um, on page three, line three, you have uh, the agency reporting back if a high quality wetlands inventory by January 1, 2030. Um, with all of the taxable base in the film state. Uh, then there were several sections that were removed based on advocate recommendations. A subsection of notice was removed, subsection on a five year, that this, this mapping be done on a five year cycle was removed, um, and the authority for the agency to seek funds uh, was all struck. Page three, sec four, this is the net gains provision. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a condition of a permit for activity in a wetland, the secretary shall require the net gain of, wet, net gain of wetlands. Um, and then in the wetland rules, the wetlands rules shall prioritize the protection of existing impact wetlands from development. I want to note that the wetlands rules don't define development. Uh, the wetlands rules are, they permit activities or uses of the wetland. I think, I don't think development is even used in the wetland rules. So you may want to change that terminology. Development is not a term used in the wetland rules. You know, suggested term that gets at the same kind of activity, or when we cross reference something else that could exist? Uh, I think it's use of their activity or impact, but I wouldn't use development. I'll tell you why you shouldn't use development in a minute. What page is the word development? Page, page three, line 20. Thank you. The logging wouldn't be development. Uh, it would be an authorized use under the wetlands rules. Um, the minute you're going to get to a definition of development where logging is development and the storage of those logs is development. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, 
I I'm fearful of you going out to the floor where there's a wetlands permit requirement where the term development is used, and then later on you define development as it's defined under FEMA, which includes any grading, paving, excavating, or storage of materials. I uh, am mm. concerned that you would raise a debate. Sweeping up too many things. The other thing that on the bottom of page three on 2021, uh, <clears throat> that is of, of change, is that there's a 5,000 square foot provision that's been added where a permitted activity within a wetland that is larger than 5,000 square feet will cause adverse effects that cannot be avoided, the secretary shall mandate that the permit outcome be stored in hands or create wetlands or buffers to compensate for adverse effects on wetland. The 5,000 square feet threshold is a new threshold. That is not currently in, in the wetlands rules. Generally, the threshold is where there is a threshold. There isn't always a threshold. And the threshold doesn't always apply. It's 2,500 square feet. Um, but if, if those rules also say that if a wetland is significant enough that it's not 2,500 square feet, it can still be regular. So you're saying with this language that the net gains requirement and the requirement to restore, enhance, or create wetlands to compensate for adverse effects only applies when that is within a wetland that's larger than 5,000 square feet regardless of its significance. Even if it's class one. It doesn't say that. It, mm -hmm. So it, it, it doesn't distinguish between class one and class two. This is just, it has to be larger than 5,000 square feet. Could be a class one, the way that the site reads. Thank you. Did not a ninth of an acre. Um, I, I think. Remember, it's not really easy to get any permit to do anything in a class one wetland, so you're probably not going to trigger it. But it doesn't say that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. So, Senator McDonald. Um, the other uh, in addition to what shall let be mentioned is also the pile of great issues um, were the language to appear to regulate uh, cropland that um, met the definition of the wetland or reduced cropland by statute um, excluded from the definition of the wetland. So, the um, Farming is both an exemption and an allowance. So if you are in a wetland doing an activity that grows food or crops in connection with farming activities, that is exempt. But that has to have occurred prior to a certain date. <laughs> has to have occurred would be prior to 1990. And be continued. If it doesn't meet the exemption, it's an allowed use. So farming is an allowed use. So whether or not a uh, tile green <clears throat> is allowed depends on which one you're following. If you're following under the exemption or the allowed use, you're not supposed to convert the wetland into a non-wetland state. But if you were exempt for 1990, you'd already had a tile green in that land, the tile green to remain. But we've got tile grades going in daily. We may not be in a wetland. Uh, 
But there's no map on them, so you don't know what's going on. Uh, there should be a map. Whether it's accurate is the other question. There's no requirement to map the installation of tile drains. So oh, there's no map of tile drains. Uh, not not existing ones going into the future. Your nutrient management plan is supposed to identify where they are, but um, that assumes you know where they are. It assumes you know where they are. Well, people put them in know where they are, but the regulators don't. Some of them are are not knowing where they are, and that this is getting larger day by day. So going into the future, your nutrient management plan is supposed to identify that. But there, there are pipes that come out of fields where people don't know where the inlet is. And, and so they don't really know how to map that. The going into the future um, means when? I mean, so you're every time your permit needs to be revised. Your NMP. Yeah. Because it's like new years? Well, for a large farm, it's pretty much every year. Every year. Okay. And if you had, um, when you revise, re up your NMP, if you had done no additional tile grains in the prior year, you have an obligation in your NMP to identify pre existing time. Um, no, I don't think you do. Okay. Um, so you'll see the two to one provision there on page four. And then again, the 5,000 square foot threshold that is added on page four, line 14. Uh, and then there's the directive to A&R to amend the weapons rules on page five and how to do that. Uh, and then you get to the wetlands permit program report. Oh, another change, page six, line six. It's not highlighted because it was made in the previous draft, but you're moving this uh, the compensation and the in lieu of compensation program and where that money can be spent for projects that had been in a, in a HUC 12 oh, level and now you moved it to a HUC 8 level. So HUC, uh, HUC 8 is actually a smaller basin than the HUC 12. No. No. Yeah. The hockey is actually the larger basin. Oh, yeah, you're right. So the hockey well, is the local basin, and the hockey is the sub basin, right? Yes, okay, got it. Mr. Chair, if folks are interested, um, one of our witnesses was kind enough to give me uh, the maps to show the hockey versus the hockey 12 for our area, or at least the link to do it. So I believe you can do that in your own districts if folks are interested. It was very helpful. So, thank you. so moving on, page six, line eight, section 919. Mm -hmm. There had been one report from the program. Now there are two. Uh, the first report begins on April 30th, 2025, and it's on annual losses and gains of significant wetlands in the state. Um, the location and acreage of best two about chaoses, um, gains, site visits, permit issue, enforcement, updated mitigation strategy, number of site visits. Subdivision five and subdivision three are duplicative. They're the same exact language. The one and can go. Um, the second report begins on a report 8 to 30, 8.7, and every five years thereafter. And that's an analysis of the historical trends, effectively, on the status of wetlands in the state, the results of the NWI mapping, and um, relevant updates to the class one and class two wetlands. 
uh, page eight, section five. This is just amending a specific enforcement section in, in chapter 47 for water quality resources and adding um, wetlands as a specific reference. A couple of years ago, you added wetlands as being protected by the water quality standards. So I think it is appropriate to add wetlands as being protected by the enforcement authority in 10 BSA 1274 A. Um, and then on page 10, this is where you get the development in river corridors. Actually, uh, before I go, section six is an appropriation section. There's 500,000 for staffing for wetlands and 500,000 for the mapping. Uh, as you all know, this will require the bill to go to the appropriations committee by the agency. Um, then uh, the development in river corridors. This, uh, these sections would uh, implement a program by which the state would require a permit for development within a flood hazard area or a river corridor. Uh, remember, this is the de definition of development from FEMA and not your definition of development from Title 24 or under Act 250. The definition of development in the FEMA NFIP program is any man-made change to improved or unimproved real estate, including but not limited to buildings or other structures, mining, dredging, filling, grading, gating, excavation, or drilling operations for storage of equipment or materials. So that is what's going to need a state permit uh, if it's going to be located in a flood hazard area, which flood hazard areas already require this kind of activity to have a permit. It's done through the municipality though. But going forward in the map river corridor, which is on page 11, the river corridor drawn and adopted by ANR as part of the statewide river corridor base map layer in accordance with the flood hazard area and river corridor protection procedure for streams and rivers with a watershed greater than two square mile. That will now require a state permit for that definition of development. Whether or not these rules will allow for a permit that's already issued by the agency for this activity to satisfy this permit requirement is unknown because, for example, the stormwater permit program requires a permit for grading if you're going to disturb more than a half an acre of earth. Yep. It requires a permit for paving. It may require a permit for excavation. So will those permits or the general permits for those activities satisfy this permit? I don't know. So something like two flag. <laughs> so you get to that. I apologize. Could you point B again to the definition that was included, but not limited to. Oh. So the definition is just a cross-reference to the federal citation. And that's page 10, line 11, the 44 CFR 59.1. Um, okay. And that, and that federal site was Please. Sure. It's any man-made change to improved or unimproved real estate, including but not limited to buildings or other structures, mining, dredging, filling, grading, paving, excavation, or drilling operation, or storage of equipment or materials. So this is the definition that, that FEMA uses for its NFIP program, because this is when, in, in conjunction with other requirements in NFIP, this is when there's a risk of flood, uh, a flood risk or a harm from flooding because of an activity within 
uh, or increased flood risk. Mm -hmm. Remember when you might, some of you might remember when they put hoop houses up in the intervale, FEMA came and said, no, that's that's an increased flood risk because you increased the soil or stirred the soil to an extent that there's like a two inch difference. And therefore that, that triggered FEMA's NFIP program. You, you're going to have, these rules are going to have to address all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's not addressed in the statute. You can you just direct the agency to adopt those rules on page 11, line 17, on a report January 1, 2026. The secretary adopts rules pursuant to the APA that establish requirements for issuing and enforcement permits for development within a flood hazard area or not for the corridor in the state. Now, the state already has a program where it permits this development in a flood hazard area, but it's only this development that's exempt from municipal regulation. Elizabeth is the one that adopted the or drafted those rules. So, but this is expanding it from not just that development that's exempt from municipal regulation that's going to be state regulated. It's all development and it's in a wider area. The entire flood hazard area? Well, no, or it's the Nath River corridor, which could be broader. It also could be, it could be narrow, but it could be broader. And what, what you're also probably going to trigger here, and it's perverse, is that you're probably going to require, it's going to lead to people in the Mac River corridor getting flood insurance. And what's perverse is that their insurance rate will be less than what the insurance rate is for the people that live in the flood hazard. Mm -hmm. Because that's how FEMA does it. FEMA's like, when it's not mandated, they want to incent it. And they incent it by having a lower rate for people that are outside the flood hazard area. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna you're gonna create probably an incentive for people to get flood hazard insurance, and it'll be at a it'll be at a rate that's less than what's in the in the flood hazard area. So what was once a carrot, now it's gonna be obligatory, and because you're gonna be in the right. clients, you're gonna get a better rate. You're gonna get a better rate. <laughs> so moving on from there, one of the things that will it will do is on page the rules will do. It'll set forth a process in collaboration with ACCD, and that reference to collaboration with the ACCD is new and the regional planning commissions for amending the statewide river car base map to identify areas within existing develop settlements <clears throat> suitable for development that will not cause or contribute to increases of fluvial erosion hazards. But remember, development is just storage of materials. And the dredging or grading. And so was are they had on the the construction foul grades fit in that definition. I don't know the answer to that question. You could combine everything. These tile grades relate to a CSO event occurring in black dots. <laughs> <laughs> so I I did I did question what's going to be identified or is for I just don't know. Right. Are you so are you expressing some concern over that sensitivity of this trigger may it may be too sensitive a trigger that we're going to I I so many activities that I think if we want to make that the trigger that's your policy decision. Yeah. I think. You should know what that means. Yeah. Well, I'm appreciative of that. I'm just wondering, you know, you're flying me for us. And when you do that, sometimes it's like the I didn't want you to know what the bill does. 
Okay. That's all I want you to know. I just want you to know that the bill is going to have a definition that's broader than what you likely consider to be development. That's now going to apply to all activities in that mapped river corridor. And it's not just the municipally exempt activities that are in the flood hazard area. Right. Then, you're going to what the bill does. You're going, I gather that when a slope is designated, the bill says people shouldn't make it less slumpy than it is. Is that what the bill says? Not this result. Right. There are other requirements that provide that that we can't change the character of the weather. Well, this bill references those requirements. It, it does. The rules. But then it's more nuanced than that. For well, it's, you know, it's, it's what we are stuck with is nuances. And I'm trying to find where the line is. I don't know where the line is. <laughs> okay. We talked about where the line is for tile greens. Well, there was a whole study committee a couple of years ago. Well, we couldn't figure out where the line was. Well, we, we, we did, and there's no record of tile drains. So you can't find the tile drains. There was it. Where you know what the line was, you couldn't apply it because there's secret there. Um, a question about. I think I'm having a hard time processing some of this. And I so I apologize for my like thickness here, but um you're not alone. <laughs> um okay, so page 12, line 17, references development. <clears throat> this is for creating uh, so this is the process for um uh, Mending the map to identify areas with an existing set of suitable for development will not cause or contribute to an increase in fluvial erosion hazards. So the development there will cause or contribute to an increase in fluvial. So this, when we use this word development, I mean, when I, so just generally speaking, aside from the federal definition, I think of development as like housing, commercial, you know, buildings, right? People putting up sheds, you know, things like that. Um, the federal definition is broader than that, includes paving, like anything with roads. It sounds like it even includes, you know, putting up the hoop houses, the intervale. It includes stacking or pay valves. Pretty good. Okay. Um, so, but this, and so all of all of that activity would now be regulated by the state in, in river corridors, which presumably in most places are going to be bigger than the flood hazard areas. That may not be true everywhere, but in most places that would probably be true. And so this is a process. They'll probably issue a general permit for how you do certain types of activities. For other activities, you're going to need an individual permit. Um, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a statewide permit program this type of development within the map here in Florida. So, and it's going to be duplicative of municipal permitting of development. So you would need both? So it's, no, it can't be due. Uh, they're, they're, are we not taking it away from municipal? Not, you're not taking away their ability to, to require a permit for development under the zoning. Okay. So they need both. Potentially, depending on what it is, and, and okay, uh, and 
does this mean that if you wanted to, I feel like stacking hay is a little bit tricky because that might also be a farming practice, which is, which, I mean, which is development, which is development. So Under the not, definition of team. Okay, so that would not be exempt. It, it's not. It currently is regulated under under the state river corridor rule because it is exempt from municipal regulation. We they already they already regulate certain farming practices. Okay, and so like let's say somebody wants to put up a hoop house in the river corridor, they would need a permit. They would because it's going to potentially increase the, the flood risk. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I mean, I can get you the current state river corridor rule, which identifies these activities and says it should be located in a flood hazard area mm -hmm. where you have to do them in a certain way in order to be authorized. That's what the current does, but that's only for that development that's exempt from municipal regulation. You're now going to say that, that all of that developed. And this is policy choice. It's up, it's up to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely a rationale for why this should be done. But you just need to understand why. Mm -hmm. Should we count? Okay. I think that was going to be different. Where does a river corridor? Get so far upstream and it no longer qualifies as a river corridor. Well, it's got to be one that's mapped by the A and R program, right? You see that on page eleven of what that map river corridor is. With the definition, it's a corridor drawn and adopted by A and R as part of the statewide river corridor base map layer in accordance with the flood hazard area under the flood protection procedure. So that's so they might, they may not get to your your streams or, or your fall streams or hooks, et cetera. It's going to be what is not by being on. So they're <clears throat> they're going to operate within their budget or with yeah, there's a size limit. It has to be it's it has to have a watershed area greater than two square miles. Yes. So there's a lot to digest here. So I, I, I know we're going to want to talk about it more, think about it more. And this is a program that ANR said that they would need significant staff. So let's sort of acknowledge that it's a little bit uh, of a lift in greeting to just so we have a sense of the bill. And we will come back. Spend more time on this. All right, so let's move out of the map river quarter program. And you're now on Dam C D page 17. Um, so there are a lot more sections being amended here. Effectively, you're amending the entire chapter. So page 17, line four, that's what it does. It amends the entire chapter. There are some sections that don't change, like uh, 1079 on line six on page 17, where the purpose section yeah. is laid out. But I thought it was helpful. The purpose of the chapter is to protect public safety and provide for the public good. Um, it's just here for context. Yeah, that's just what I think you've got. Great. And that's not an excerpt. That is the entire. That is the entire purpose of this okay. of this chat. Um, one of the what the main thing that this chapter does is it shifts responsibility for dams in the state from what it was called the state agency having jurisdiction, and now jurisdiction for dam safety is going to be with the Department of Environmental Conservation Dam Safety Program, and the PUC will no longer have jurisdiction over dam safety. The PUC retains authority over the CPG and any activity related to the CPG 
and the generation of electricity. Um, so you will see very similar changes throughout this chapter, beginning on page 19, line 12, where the powers or the jurisdiction is now limited to the department. Any reference to the PUC is struck. So unless otherwise provided, the powers and duties authorized by this chapter shall be exercised by the Department of Environmental Conservation. Chairman Cummings. This is not a substance. I want to understand how to read the bill. This does not have, this does not say that we're deleting the language that gave the, gave the ballot to the PUC. No, but you're, you're going to see provisions in here that explicitly reference that the PUC re retains its authority over seeds for electric generation. So, what is it? The line right up here, you know, that, that uh, section, uh, the 10 BSA chapter 4 thing is amended to read. So, this is sort of like what we do with the constitutional amendment. If it passes, this is what the law would say, rather than adding and deleting from existing law. No, that you are adding and deleting from existing law. But we're not stating the deletion. Where are we're saying if, the, if this bill passes, this is what the law will say. And the law will no longer say the part we're deleting. That, that's correct. It's, it's the normal process. Right. But uh, often we we do smaller changes. And, it's, and then you have the actual... The, the, well, does that apply to strike? That was probably have a lot. Right. I mean, page 19, lines 15 through 20, if the jurisdiction is struck. Right. Okay. An existing law of the PUC. Exactly. That's being so struck. That's what I was looking for regarding. Um, All right. Um, so you'll see just, I'm moving quickly through this, that a lot of this, these changes are really just changing state agency, having jurisdiction to the department or, or removing any reference to the PUC with regard to safety. Um, page 24, line four, PEC is the one going to be issuing CPGs for dam safety or any of the activities that require uh, a dam safety order, construction and care, renovation, et cetera, related to safety. Um, then on page 26, line 7, 1087, uh, this is a current requirement that the state agency having jurisdiction shall currently they employ the required to employ an engineer to investigate the property review the plans. So the language here would direct that DEC shall require an engineer to investigate the property. The engineer conducting the investigation shall be an employee of the department or shall be operating under the supervision of the department as an independent consultant. So DEC can hire consultants if they don't have the engineer staffing on within the agency. Similarly, on um, page 26, line 18, uh, with the approval of the governor, DEC may require an engineer to invest in the property, review the plans and specifications, and make additional investigations. The, the, that engineer shall be operating under the control of the department. Um, and then you get to the big section, page 27, line 13, 1091, liability for dam breach. And it's going to be whatever standard you want or if it's going to include the standard. Currently, we've already discussed how I think it can be read as strict liability for high hazard and negligence for all others. Um, and I, I don't need to go through that again. I, right. I mean, well, we have more to figure out, but I guess just here or not. Uh, 
there are changes to the unsafe dam petition language, but it's really just clarifying um, about who has jurisdiction and then the hearing. You'll see in these changes that it looks like all the hearing requirements are going away. It's, it's they're not. They're just being moved to ANR's default standard provisions, which already require certain types of public notice and hearing for certain types of activities. You're not you're not removing public notice in here. You're just it's already incorporated in the standard procedures. Um, so, so it's in a way just bringing the hearing process into the standard process. Yeah, because you have done this, the general assembly have done this for me free of A and R program. Instead of sending out what the enforcement authority, the appeal authority, and the public notice authority is in every single chapter that AR implements. You just moved everything to one chapter. There's one enforcement chapter, one appeals chapter, and one public notice chapter. And then you list under those chapters which provisions apply. Um, DEC is going to do inspection of dams. Um, there was new language added based on the auditor's report <laughs> at the bottom of page 30, line 19, when the dam owned by the state, DEC provides the inspection report to the designated point of contact uh, for the dam. Uh, and then for notice of an unsafe dam, same thing, another auditor recommendations with the state agency having jurisdiction over a dam, that should say the department, uh, determines that the state dam is unsafe and in need of repair, the department shall immediately notify the designated point of contact of the state if you need an of dam and makes this information available. There were significant changes to the unsafe dam revolving loan fund. It's now just the dam safety revolving loan fund. It's not just if your dam is unsafe. They will provide low or zero interest loans, including subsidized loans. Uh, funds from the fund shall be available for both emergency and non-emergency projects. There are conditions for the use for emergency funding, um, and then there are conditions for the use of non-emergency funding. Um, a lot of this you've seen before, it's highlighted because there were some tweaks honestly go to the organization to make it work a little bit better. Um, but most of the substance is the same as what you've seen before. Um, and I'm just moving quickly because of time. Uh, turn it down. Is the designation of unsafe appealable? Yes. How does that work? Uh, any act or decision of the secretary is appealable under 10 BSA chapter 205. So until that appeal is worked through, it's supposed to be an arm Right. And you, you have, it's a de novo review. You have the opportunity to show your facts that are. Engineering analysis that supports that it's not safe for the department has the same opportunity. Um I think about advanced safety at this point. You're in basin planning, the requirement that the state conduct basin planning routine planning process under the Federal Clean Water Act, satisfied by a and doing basin plans for each of the 15 watersheds. One of the things that the basin plan will now be required to include is to identify opportunities to mitigate impacts of severe precipitation events, meaning use for implementation of nature-based restoration projects or practices that increase natural flood water attenuation and storage. So they're going to identify nature-based um, flood response practices. And that's, I mean, I think it's it's a smart thing to do. 
if you're if you're planning, you're already in the watershed, why not try to come to your left? Uh, ANR is given three hundred and fifty thousand in uh, fiscal year twenty twenty five on three new permanent full time fast five positions in the Galaxy. This is Senator Westman's bill, effectively. That language. Uh, and then you get to page. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the three new permanent full time positions could be keeping the temporary person and making them new. Would that so you, can, you can't just do that. I tried to do that originally, and then the JFO told me, no, I can't do that. <laughs> that I have to create three. Because the limited service position can't just be transformed into a full time position okay. because you have to have that that full time position appropriated or authorized at the agency. Okay. So that's why it reads the way it does. You know, the concept is to take those two limited service M's. Yeah. And then there would be one of the, or two of the three. Um, but I couldn't just transform them or say that they were going to be. But it's not on top of it, it would most likely be. Okay. Is that in addition to, it wouldn't be. Right. Okay. It, the, their budget would need to be changed to reflect that. Okay. Thank you. So it's budget neutral for the two that are already there, but it's an addition. <laughs> right. And, and then they would have to authorize all three of those positions. Remember, the yeah. big bill says at the beginning of it no new positions are created unless authorized by this bill. <laughs> So then you get to page 39 going on to page 40. This is the expanded polyester foam bill. Uh, I was directed to put it in here. It's it's H373. It prohibits uh, the use of expanded polystyrene foam um, unless it is totally encapsulated. Um, so it can't be used for a buoy or a dock or a wrap, et cetera, unless the foam is totally encapsulated. Um, there are four or five jurisdictions, depending on who you talk to, that already do the state jurisdictions, Oregon, Washington, North Carolina, maybe Tennessee, maybe Florida. Um, and then there's a ton of municipal jurisdictions that do it. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into with this. I think um, we talked about it last week. So. Visuals. <laughs> um, let's we have like one minute. Is there anything you want to call out to us in there? I mean, I think we had a ample this, but we spent some time talking about the provisions. I don't know if there's anything that a uh, lawyer you would say, here's something that may be controversial, or you should know you're actually making a big deal change by doing X, Y, or Z. Um, the, the, one, the one thing you should be, um, some states, this is just perspective, mm -hmm. or some jurisdiction perspective, on page five, you'll see unused or replaced polystyrene foam shall be removed from the waters of the state and shall be recycled or disposed of. So this is gonna this is going to apply to to existing uses. And so they will be required to be phased out. I'm looking in your same page five. In our craft bill. Oh, in, in the, the larger, I'm sorry. That's okay. Let me just make sure where you are. Uh, <laughs> so it's the removal in water. Um, it's page 42, lines 11. Unused, we have to place the polystyrene phone. I think replace is clear. But unused, I don't really know what that means. Um, so this was this was based on Washington State. Um, uh, one of those things I'd like to clarify is what needs to be removed. 
But because otherwise it's a pers perspective bill. Yeah. So which page was? Uh, 40, 40, um, two, line 11 through 13. This, um, That's not the count. Just interesting if the Washington would weigh in here because uh, what of course I was going to ask was about the Brookfield floating bridge that Washington is the only other floating bridge in the United States. And the last floating bridge in Brookfield had this type of problem in it. And it oh, the bridge is was it encapsulated inadequately. And that was one of the reasons that it ended up being replaced because the bridge was a uh, second. Sicky. Well, you will see that there are encapsulation standards in this bill. Page 41, um, 42. There can be gaps um, in the physical barrier covering provided that they are 0.1% or less of the square footage. It's just kind of like the fiscal possibility of wrapping some of this stuff. There's going to probably be a gap here or there. I, mean, I don't think it has the stuff in it. It has something else belonging into the the. Uh, well, that that's the beads. The beads are also covered by this definition. It should be fused, not limits. Right. Um. There's fifty thousand that's appropriated from the general fund of DDC for staffing requirements. I don't know if 50 grand is enough um, for this or not. Then the effective dates, I would move a lot of what's in the effective dates to a transition section, but the big decision you need to make here is with the regard to when the jurisdiction over the PUC dams shifts to DEC for purposes of safety. Right now, there's a schedule in here um, that said by July 1, 2025, the agency shall assume jurisdiction over dams with a high hazard classification. And then by July 1, 2028, the agency shall assume jurisdiction over all other dams. Well, that really means that the PUC retains jurisdiction over its current 21 dams until July of 2028. Because none of them are high hazard. Well, no, some of them are high hazard, but you have to give them, they have to retain jurisdiction over, over dams until July of 2028. So why? Because you're not transferring jurisdiction over all of them all until 2028. Why? Well, part of the reason is because D D DEC is concerned about their work. Because the DEC is adopting rules right now for for dam repair, construction, et cetera, et cetera. And those rules last year, you delayed them until July of 2025, I believe. Yeah. And so they don't want to be doing that rulemaking and then taking on the jurisdiction of the dams. And really, they're worried about the high hazard dams that the PUC has. So DEC. Won't be ready till then to take. I, I think they want it, kind of makes sense to have all the rules in place yeah. before the DEC takes jurisdiction. And they're not sure they can get the rules in place. Well, you're basically requiring to have the rules in place and take jurisdiction at the same time, July of 25, for high hazard dams. I think you could probably, if you made the date of transfer July 1 of 2026, their rules will be done. They'll have capacity to take on the high hazard dam. They're not worried about the low hazard dams or the even the significant, they're worried about the high hazard dam. If you give them two years to finalize their rules and take on jurisdiction, 
I I think they'd be okay with that. Uh, so we'll have I mean, that go through screens at that level. Okay. Um, and then a lot of this other stuff, you got to move to a transition section. Um, because it really shouldn't be, it's not effective. And I can do that if you would like. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Thank you, Rogo. We are seven minutes past. Appreciate people are staying so that we could finish. Um, one complete revision. Nick Bailey, thank you for your uh, second round of being patient with our evolving schedule, and we will have the audience. You're actually already on the schedule, I think, uh, first up, because I knew this could happen. So we'll see you tomorrow, we hope.